Здравствуйте, welcome back to Russian Three Poems and Paintings. We're on day 151, starting book four. And uh, today's topic, and one we'll keep for the next couple of days, is uh, verbs of position. And you can think of these as being something like verbs of motion, uh, in the sense that they're just kind of complicated. Russian, because Russian tends to be a bit more specific about describing placement and being in a position and so forth, uh, when compared to English. Uh, if we think back to verbs of motion, we we remember that we introduce those basically by saying that in English, we, we use the verb to go all the time, right? Uh, whereas Russian is a bit more specific, not only about the type of motion, like are we going by foot or by uh, vehicle, and also the, the type of motion itself, well, in the sense of determinacy, right? Are we underway? Are we walking around? Are we making round trips? Are we setting out and so forth? So essentially, we're in English, we often are just dealing with one very simple verb to go. In Russian, we've got to learn kind of sets of verbs for each type of motion. Okay, so even though the verbs of motion are actually totally different than verbs of position, the basic difficulty is the same, right? So let's first make clear that verbs of position are totally different for verbs of motion, but the difficulty is, is kind of along the same lines. Okay, so what, how do verbs of position work? Okay, well, it's pretty simple, actually. There are four positions basic positions in Russian, right? A uh, standing, a standing position, a sitting position, a lying position, and a hanging position. Okay, so four positions. Sort of like, you know, with verbs of motion, we had different types of motion, like going on foot, going by vehicle, dragging, uh, leading, and all that stuff, right? So four basic positions for which Russian has, we can think of three different verbs, right? So for example, the sitting position will have three different sets of infinitives, um, one will mean to be in the position, and the the second will mean to assume the position, that is to move into the position, and the third one is means to put something else into that position, right? So the idea is you've got a verb meaning to be to be sitting, like I am now, right? Another verb to mean to get into that position, right? To assume a seating position, and then another one which would mean to put something else or someone else into it. A sitting, a seated, seated position. Okay, so uh, so that's really all there is to it, right? We just have to again. It's sort of like with verbs of motion, we were very strict about you know gdia, kuda, and so forth, right? We've got kind of that same thing where we've got to be very careful thinking about which verb means to be in the position, which is sort of a gdia kind of a statement, right? You're in a certain location in a position, and then the other two, right, moving into the position, assuming the position or putting something else into the position, position, those are going to be kuda ideas usually, right? You're moving into a position, into a space or whatever. Okay, so to simplify this, sort of like with verbs of motion, we're going to spend three days on this, and we're going to take uh, one group of, of infinitives at a time, right? Today we're taking the simplest one, and today's lesson really is quite simple. Uh, we're talking about being in a position. Okay, so again, this is one of those things in, in Russian, it's fairly easy, really, but we really have to, uh, to to insist on using our imagination to be very clear about what the Russian is saying. So the verbs we're going to use today, we're going to have four of them, only four infinitives. They describe being in a position. Okay, now one, one little um, word of warning. One thing, habit I got into, uh, and, I'm, and I'm following a professor, a former professor of mine at Princeton and doing this, and I, I continue to teach it this way, is... Um, so think back to verbs of motion. We, you know, we learned how to translate them, and we said that so often a verb of a Russian verb of motion will translate simply as to go, right? That's how we would actually translate it if we were putting it into natural English. But as you know by now very well, right, a lot of information is often lost when we do that, right, when we actually translate it into natural English. So one way initially to kind of help our imagination is to unpack a verb of motion, right? So for example, it means to be underway on foot, and yechit means to be underway by vehicle, and so forth, right? We sort of use keywords and just some sort of uh, more elaborate uh, unpacking to a, a phrase to really capture exactly what the Russian verb is saying. Okay, so one way to do this with verbs of position is to use this word position, basically, right? So for example, today, the verb sidiet will learn, well, it means to, to sit or to be sitting, but maybe an even clearer way to do, to say that, to unpack it, would be to be in a seated position or to be in a sitting position. Okay, that's going to be very clearly differentiate that from, say, tomorrow we're talking about assuming a sitting position, moving into a sitting position. That's going to be something totally different in Russian. And then finally, we're going to have putting something else into a seated or sitting position. Okay, so again, if we're careful initially to sort of unpack these verbs that way, 
uh, instead of just sort of being sloppy about them and say, oh, well, this verb has something to do with sitting, but we're not very clear about what who's really doing what to to, to what, right? We have to be very careful. And uh, one way to do that is to unpack the verb. Okay, so uh, wh- why is that so important? Uh, let's start out actually with a painting before I get to that. Uh, fairly famous painting, Achotniki na Privalia. Uh, Prival kind of means like you're you're taking a little sitting break or something. It has to do with that motion verb valiatsa, valitsa, right? That is the same um, the same sort of tumbling root, right? So they've sort of plopped themselves down here in the field for a break, right? Uh, to have a rest. Okay, so how how can we describe this picture using some verbs we'll see today? Achotniki, that is the hunters. Achotniki sidiat na travie posle achoty. Okay, so sidiet, we may have seen that verb already, I don't remember, but that's uh, one of the verbs today. It means to be in a sitting position. Okay, so these, these guys are in a sitting position. Okay, they're sitting on the grass, literally, after a hunt, after the hunt, and they're conversing. Okay, so alongside... Uh, lay, lie, I should say lie. Okay, more on that in a moment. See, I misspoke. Okay, so they're lying, or we could say again, unpacking it, these, they are in a lying position. Okay, and then we get our subject, killed birds and a rabbit. Okay, so all these animals they've shot so mercilessly, right, are in a lying position all around, right? I need lijat, they're in a lying position, or we, you know, we would say they're lying, they're lying around. And in the meantime, right, uh, not far away, there stands a dog, right? And again, stayat is the new verb, meaning it means to be in a standing position. So again, if we were unpacking this a bit more carefully, we could say the dog is in a standing position. What is the dog doing? Um, I have no idea, really. I, maybe it's got a bone. I don't, I don't know what it's doing. Maybe it's digging a hole. Okay, we can only speculate. Okay, so let's get back to this. Uh, you heard me misspeak there just a moment ago. And, um, you know, I, when I went to use the word to lie, right? Now, you know, I'm sure that um, what, a lot of native speakers of English don't really know the difference between to lie and to lay, right? Not to mention all the other forms of that of that verb, right? Now, one, the you know, the real difficulty is that the, the, the verbs are so similar, right? If they were more different sounding, it would probably be easier to keep them straight, but an additional reason for this confusion is that we don't really have this clear sort of, uh, you know, regular distinction made in English between being in a position, that is to lie, and to put into a position, meaning to lay, right? We don't we don't very clearly, ma- I mean, we know there is a difference, I guess, in theory, but the, the language doesn't really reflect that in a systematic way, and that helps explain why people are, are always confusing those words. And, you know, I catch myself, believe me, I know the difference. I just take my word for it. I know the difference. Even even so, I make mistakes sometimes in class. It just I, I spit out the wrong word, and I'm like, God, you know, how, how many times have I been over this? I still uh, commit these terrible gaffes. Okay, um, so let's look at examples, and you'll see this actually even more crazy than, than it seems. Let's, take, let's talk about um, standing, right? Standing in English, a standing position. Uh, quite amazingly, the same verb to stand can mean all three, that, that same Russian, same English verb can mean, can basically translate into three different Russian verbs, right? Because the verb to stand can mean first to be in a standing position. For example, he stood at the bus stop. Okay, so think very clearly, what does that mean? If we were going to now translate this into Russian, we'd have to be very careful. He was in a standing position at the bus stop, right? That's what he was doing. Okay, now the same verb to stand can mean to assume a standing position, right? Now, usually in English, we'd say to stand up, you know, we'd, we'd add that little addition to it, but uh, the verb to stand all by itself can mean this. For example, he stood on his head, right? So same verb, he, he's standing on his head or he stood on his head, right? That means if we were unpacking, he assumed a standing position on his head. Okay, so that would go into a different you know, verb in, in, in Russian. Finally, to stand can also mean to put into a standing position. He stood the ladder against the wall, right? So, um, so again, you see the confusion. Um, this also overlaps with another huge issue in, in terms of English versus Russian. That is the failure so often of English to differentiate between intransitive and transitive verbs. For example, to stand 
can mean like in number one, to be standing. That's what we call an intransitive verb because it can't take an object, right? You can't stand someone at the bus stop. I, I mean, it doesn't ordinarily it wouldn't make much sense, right? But you can stand a ladder against the wall, right? That would be a transitive use of the verb. And we've mentioned this already, right? That so often, um, you know, Russian makes a very clear distinction between that type of thing, uh, you know, where, whereas English often will use the very same verb for, for both things. Okay, so we could talk more about this, but we, we have to be very careful. And again, especially when we talk about uh, the lying position, right? That just introduces a totally different um, problem for, for even educated English speakers. Uh, you know, it may be, sometimes it's the case that learning Russian may help you a little bit with your formal English, right? I mean, because you, you kind of pick up on what, what the deal is um, and, and it may help you. Okay, so anyway, let's look at today's verbs. Now, today we're on easy street. We only have four infinitives. Now, why, why, why is that? We don't have pairs for these verbs describing being in a position because uh, these are sort of logically imperfective, right? You're in a position. It's, a, it's kind of a state, right? So we only have for today's verbs four infinitives all by themselves, not a pair. Okay, our first two verbs today, we do have some somewhat unusual types here, especially the first one. I don't, I'm not sure we've even really formally introduced these verbs. These are called ja verbs. Okay, so let's look at one and then we'll talk about what that means, ja. Okay, le ja, it's that verb, if we unpack it, means to be in a lying position. Okay, so again, if you unpack that in this way and understand it in this way, it's very clear what that means. Le ja, it means to be in a lying position. Okay, ja verbs, this, this uh, little verb type tag, ja is one of the more confusing ones. Um, Basically, the, the je can mean either a je, as we have in this verb, actually, le je, or two other things. It can stand for another hushing consonant, like ch, sh, sh, or it can uh, stand basically for an ikratkaya, um, in which case, well, more on that in a moment. We'll see an example here. Okay, so let's take le je. Now, the, the key really is not so much knowing what ja means. It's just kind of a tag, after all. The most important things about these verbs is that they take the E endings. And remember, now we've seen all three, there are only three types of verbs in, in Russian that take E endings. E verbs, Y verbs, which we're about to review, and finally, Ja verbs. Okay, so if you can remember that, that's that's really useful. All the other types will take Y endings. Okay, now, so there aren't, there aren't just tons and tons and tons of these Ja verbs, but there are a few, and some of them are very important, including the ones we're learning to, today. So uh, it, would be, it would be great to learn this pattern. Okay, so lijats. The pattern is lijou, lijish, lijit, lijim, lijit, lijat. Note the spelling there, eight letter spelling rule telling, telling us we have to write a ah there. Okay, the uh, past tense would be lijal, lijal, etc. Right, very uh, regular. Okay, now let's take stayat. Here's the other kind of major variation, right? You, you, now let's imagine what's going on here. The spelling is a bit confusing. Right, we see we, we, we have the verb sto yat. Um, what's taking place of the je here in this particular verb is an ikratkaya, right? So we have basically a stem stoy, stoy, ending in an ikratkaya, to which we add at, and then because of Russian orthography, we kind of change the spelling, we'll get sto yat, right? Yat. Okay, but uh, again, we look at how this works out. Um, we don't actually write the ikratke anywhere except in the imperative, right? The imperative stoy is the bare stem of the verb, right? So sometimes that happens, as we know, and that gives us a little, some insight into how this verb is actually built. But in all other forms, we don't actually write any ikratke. Okay, so a little confusing. We just learned this pattern. Uh, it's not really that crazy. Stayu, stayish, stayit, stayim, stayitye. Stayat. Now, if you're wondering, there is another verb, stoit, which is an E verb, and that means to cost, right? So people are always confusing those two verbs. Uh, you might want to make a note in the margin of your book, stoit, stoit, an E verb, and note the stress on the O, stoit. That's the verb meaning to cost. Okay, the next two verbs today, the final two verbs are ye yeah verbs. Now, people confuse these. We've seen quite a few of these already, but people do confuse them. Remember that ye, ye verbs work exactly like e verbs, um, meaning when we conjugate them, we add the e endings. Okay, so we start getting e e e everywhere and not ye ye ye. That's the mistake people uh, make 
quite often. Okay, so сидеть means to be in a sitting position. Сижу, сидишь, сидит, сидим, сидите, сидят, and so forth. Висеть means to be in a hanging position, right, to be hanging. Вишу, висишь, висит, висим, висите, висят. Okay, or виси would be the imperative. Uh, now, do note that in the past tense, we do, of course, keep the yeah, because we're going there straight from the infinitive, right? Getting rid of the soft T, adding L, and so we end up with сидел, сидела, сидела, сидели, etc. Okay, so uh, now let's talk a bit about choosing verbs of position. Uh, now, this is, again, the, the this other difficulty we mentioned, sort of like with verbs of motion, right? Where in English we say to go rather vaguely, and Russian tends to be a bit more specific. So similarly with verbs of position, right, Russians tend typically to be a bit more specific about how they're positioning something, uh, right? So later we'll, we'll learn when we talk about putting things into a position, we'll say like, are you, are you laying something flat onto the table or onto the bookshelf or are you standing it, right? Are you placing it into a standing position on the bookshelf like all of my books back there, right? They're in a standing position, most of them, although I see one right there, Right, there are a few that are in a lying position. Okay, so we've got to be very careful, again, just thinking, what position are we talking about, first of all? And then, are we in the position? Are we moving into the position? Are we putting something else into the position? Okay, so this is, I guess, for the most part, fairly intuitive, right? Uh, uh, the first two, let's take hanging and sitting. Okay, those are just completely obvious, right? If someone's sitting, if, if something's hanging on the wall or whatever, those are pretty obvious. Um, now, the, the the other two can be a little bit more peculiar, maybe. A standing position, of course, means something that's basically upright, but that doesn't always necessarily mean just verticality, right, just sheer verticality. It, for, so, for example, a, pieces of furniture that may be kind of horizontal, more or less, like a bed or a sofa, uh, especially if they have little legs, right, and and they're, they're, they're placed as they should be, meaning upright. They're upright on their legs, they're not tumbled over or something like this. They're upright. Russians would use standing to describe things like that. Again, even though they're not really straight up and down, they don't have this verticality. Okay, so something like that, like a chair or a sofa or a table, instead of standing in its proper upright position, had been overturned or was kind of sprawling around. Maybe someone's house has been burglarized or whatever, stuff is all over the place, then you would use the lying verb, right? Like the, the sofa is lying on the floor. That would be, I guess, a bit more unusual. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples of these. Lampa stayed в углу. The lamp is in a standing position in the corner. Okay, so maybe a tall lamp, it's standing, it's upright. Stali stayat du akna. The tables are standing, so to speak, at the window. Right. Uh, now, again, think about in English, we'd probably normally say something like, well, the tables are near the window. They're at the window. We wouldn't really usually specify some type of position for them. Uh, third example, Kravat stayala vozli stala. The bed was in a standing position near the table, right? It was standing near the table. That means it's upright. Okay, so here are some uh, other examples. Knigi lijat na stalia. The books are lying on the table. Okay, meaning they're flat. Okay, so they're, you know, that makes sense. Okay, but if they're on a bookshelf and they're upright, that would be standing position in Russian, right? And we'd say, knigi stayat na polkia. Literally, they are in a standing position on the shelf. Finally, stulia lejali na palu. The chairs were lying on the floor. Okay, kind of like in English, that would Im imply that they've been overturned, there's, there's disorder and so forth. Okay, so let's... um. Use some, fill in some present tense verbs, uh, and just basically here we're just choosing position. Again, today's lesson is pretty easy. Uh, okay, so number one, the picture is hanging on the wall. Okay, so hanging would be the only thing to make much sense here, I guess. Cartina visit na stinia. Number two, the portrait is blank on the table. Okay, sounds like it, it, okay, it could be, some of these, it could be a couple of things, but let's assume normally that things are as they should be then it's probably upright, right? It's standing on the table. Now, if it were lying on the table flat, then of course we would say legit. Okay, number three, the paper is blank on the table. Okay, probably lying flat, we assume. Number four, the table is blank at the, sorry, the chair is something near the table at the table. 
Okay, we assume it's upright. We would say stool staito stala. Uh, Piet, uh, the dog is blanking on the floor and uh, <laughs> okay, and sleeping. Okay, <clears throat> so the, the well, if he's sleeping, I assume he's lying down. So sabaka lijit na palu ispit. Okay, shest, uh, the father is blanking in the easy chair and reading. Okay, we assume sitting, I guess. Atiet sidit kresli ichitayet. Okay, what if dad's in his lazy boy or whatever and he's reclining? Okay, well, of course, then we could say, Okay, number seven, Dieti blank behind the table, literally, meaning at the table, and they're having lunch. Okay, sounds like they're sitting. Dieti sidiat za stalomi abiedoyut. Voicium, the mirror is blanking on the wall. It's in a hanging position on the wall. Zirkala visit na stinia. Dievich, all my books are, let's say, standing on the bookshelves, right? Uh, knigi stayat na polkie. Okay, and again, that assumes kind of the they're they're upright the way they should be in theory, right? If they're lying flat on the shelf, we would say lijat. Dievich in the bedroom, blank two beds. Okay, so this would be standing, assuming they're not overturned or something. Spalnia. Stayat dvie kravati, right, a plural uh, subject. Okay, uh, sits in the living room, blank two carpets. Okay, those, those are, we assume, lying. Spalnia lijat dvie, sorry, v gastinli lijat dva kavra. Okay, dvienatsits, the passengers are blanking in the bus. Okay, sitting, let's assume, pasajeri sidiat v avtobusie. Okay, since today's lesson is kind of easy, I thought I'd throw in some review, right? Prepositions of location. So we've had quite a few of these already. It might be a good time to just review review these, right? And I've got them here grouped by case. Um, so pretty useful stuff here. We've no use really in going over it again. It's, it's in theory review, but very useful stuff. Okay, so let's uh, just fill in now some nouns, now using them with our... Uh, our verbs and uh, choose the right case form. Okay, so the number one, idea the bed is standing literally or is in a standing position. Why don't I go ahead and unpack these just to be clear? The bed is in a standing position between two tables, two little tables. Kravat stayit mejdu dvumya stolikami, right? Instrumental plural. Dva, my shirt is lying beneath the bed. Instrumental, uh, that's an e noun, remember, kind of tricky. Maya rubashka lijit pad kravatsu. Three, the television is standing uh, or is in an upright position, in a standing position opposite the sofa. Televizor stayed na protiv divana, genitive. Chitiri, uh, the mirror is hanging above the sink, the rakavina. Zirkala visit nad, nad rakavina, right? Instrumental. Piat. Our cat is always lying on the newspaper, always in a lying position on the newspaper. Okay, actually, let's take that example. You know, if we unpack this carefully, right, she's always in a lying position on the newspaper. Okay, so that's a little bit different here, especially in the Russian than saying she's always lying down on the newspaper or maybe she's always getting on the newspaper or whatever, right? There again, we would use a different verb we're going to use later, meaning to assume a lying position. Here, we are seeing the cat. She is in a lying position. She's always lying there on the newspaper. Okay, shes. Now we're using the, a different, uh, what's actually a verb of motion, right? Nechaditsa, meaning to be located, to be found, literally. So that's also a fairly useful uh, verb for describing position or location, uh, even though it's not really quite like these other four verbs of position. Рядом с нашим домом находится магазин, right? A store is located, is found uh, next to our building. Siem, literally behind my window or in my window, outside my window, uh, tall trees are in a standing position. За моим окном стоят высокие деревья. Восем, upon entrance into the, or, sorry, near the entrance into the museum is found the ticket office, ticket desk. 
Приходе, right? При means, uh, takes the uh, prepositional. При входе в музей находится касса. Девять. Uh, the dog is always lying near the radiator, the heater. Собака все время лежит возле радиатора. Right, genitive with возле. Uh, check your book. Uh, the, there's a typo here that I'll correct. It, it's not vremya, of course, it's vremya. So check the stress on that word. Uh, mea culpa. Okay, yes, it's uh, in the theater. I, okay, past tense now. I used to sit, or I would sit, right? It could be described habitual action. Remember, these are imperfective, these verbs today. Or I was sitting, or I would sit next to my friends. В театре я сидел рядом с друзьями. Instrumental plural. Один сидит above the wardrobe uh, hang two posters. They're in a hanging position. Над шкафом висят два плаката. Двенадцать opposite the theater is a metro, a subway station. Okay, here we're just using yes, which of course we could also do, right? Um, kind of like находить, so that's kind of a more general way to talk about where something is located. Um, напротив театра есть станция метро. Okay, so in the book, you've got a painting that you could just kind of a, a, write a, a kind of domestic scene here with furniture and pictures and windows. So you could try maybe describing, using today's verbs to describe what position these things are in. For example, the knižny shkaf, you could say, for example, knižny shkaf stait mezdu dvumia oknami, or mezdu oknami, right? It's standing in a standing position between the windows, right? The cartini, the pictures, Visyat na for example, they're hanging on the wall. Or we could say, ani visyat nad knižnim shkafam, right above the, uh, well, one of them is, right? Adin, adna kartina visit nad knižnim shkafam. Uh, stulia, right? Where are they, right? What about the stool, the table? Well, we'd use the verb stayat for those, right? Because they're upright in a standing position. Zanavieski, right? Where are they hanging, right? Ani visiat. Um, what about the mats? Okay, she's in a sitting sitting position, right? So we'd say mats sidit za stalom or whatever. Dochka, dochka toje sidit. You could say rядом с мамой, for example. Uh, finally, the the uh, derevia, right? That irregular plural of dereva. Where are the trees? Well, you can't see them too well, but they're za. Aknoam, right there, literally again beyond the window, outside the window, and we could say that they stayat derevia stayat zaknoam. Okay, let's take a moment to uh, see some of these verbs of position in action, right? Uh, and read two uh, very, very famous scenes from Vaina i Mir, right? Uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace. Uh, so I'll just read this text, and uh, you can read along, and we'll pay special attention to. Uh, well, we'll try to spot the verbs of position and also, again, be very careful to interpret them, right? To, uh, to unpack them in a way that makes very clear what the Russian is actually saying. Okay, so uh, this is my little blurb here, right? This is not from War and Peace starting out here. Right, all of the heroes of Tolstoy seek or look for meaning in life, right? They're looking for meaning in their lives. And there's a genitive for more of a kind of abstract, more of an abstract search, right? So they're not looking for, a, a, you know, as, as I often say, a tasty cheeseburger. They're looking for meaning in life, right? It's somewhat loftier. And often with that, you get, um, with, with, with searches or desires of that sort, you get genitive direct objects. Kniaz Andrei Balkonsky, na premier, postoyano zadayot sibye takie vaprosy. So Prince Andrei Balkonsky is one of the major heroes of War and Peace. He, for example, постоянно задает себе. He, he's constantly posing to himself такие вопросы, right? Questions like the following. Есть ли смысл в этой жизни? Is there meaning in this life? Возможно ли любовь на этом свете? Is love possible in this world? Есть ли Бог или нет Бога? Right, is there a God or is there no God, right? Однажды он проезжает мимо старого некрасивого дуба. So once, right, there's a, this episode in the novel, he happens to be driving past or riding. I, I think he's just on horseback. He may be in a carriage. I don't remember. 
At any rate, he's riding past an old, ugly uh, oak tree. Эта дерево как будто ему говорит, что его жизнь уже прошла, и надеяться ему уже не на что. Right? So this tree, as, as it were, как будто, right, it seems to be saying to him, right, it's so old and ugly and it looks dead. Uh, it seems to be saying to him that his life has already gone past, right? His life is already essentially over, right? He's starting to get older. И надеяться ему уже не на что, right? And he, there's one of those tricky stressed не expressions, right? There is nothing for which he can hope, right? He has nothing, no hope left, nothing to hope for. Okay, so let's uh, get just a very brief passage here from Tolstoy. На краю дороги стоял дуб. Этот дуб как будто говорил, весна и любовь и счастье. И как не, надо, как не надо есть вам все один и тот же глупый бессмысленный обман. Все одно и то же, и все обман. Нет ни весны, ни солнца, ни счастья. Okay, so you see in the bold, there's our verb of position. On, on the edge of the road, literally, стоял дуб. Right there stood an oak tree. An oak tree was in a standing position. Это дуб как будто говорил. And this oak tree seemed to say, весна и любовь и счастье. Right, spring and love and happiness. Uh, it's saying, I guess, kind of mockingly. И как не надо есть вам все один и тот же глупый бессмысленный обман. Okay, so our subject here, as so often happens, comes at the end, right? How can it be that один и тот же, right, one and the same, the same old, stupid, meaningless illusion, how can it be that this hasn't gotten on your nerves, essentially, right? Как не надо есть вам все один и тот же глупый бессмысленный обман. I'm not sure if we've seen this verb, nada yedat, nada yest. It's a really useful one. It takes a, a dative object and it means to annoy, right? To irritate someone, to get on someone's nerves. Right, so the oak tree seems to be saying, aren't you, aren't you sick of this same old stupid illusion, right? This idea that there's such a thing as rebirth, right? The rebirth of spring and love and happiness, right? Все одно и то же, и все обман, right? It's all one and the same, right? It's all the same old thing, and everything is an illusion, right? Abman. Нет ни весны, ни солнца, ни счастья, right? There's the нет of non-existence, right? A really good example. There are, There is no such thing as spring, as sun, as happiness, right? Okay, now, uh, if you've read War and Peace, you may know that later, uh, a bit later, Andrei Balkonsky rides past this oak tree again, and he's astounded to see that it's sprung to life, right? It's got new leaves coming out of it. And so it, although it appeared dead, right, it eventually, it too came to life with all the other trees uh, in spring, right? So it, it, this, it's a very symbolic uh, thing in the novel. Right, so let's read about this here in my little blurb. Через некоторое время Андрей проезжает мимо того же дуба в другой раз уже весной. Right, a certain time later, Андрей rides past the same oak for a second time уже весной, this time in spring. Uh, a bit later in spring, I should say. И он не верит своим глазам, and he can't believe his eyes. Right, note the dative there with believing. Дуб снова живой, весь в зеленых листьях. The oak tree is again alive, and it's it's completely, right, all of it, весь, весь дуб, the whole oak tree is in green leaves. Okay, so we could say it's, it's completely covered with green leaves. Значит, жизнь еще не прошла. This means that life hasn't yet gone past, right, that rebirth is possible. By the way, that, that kind of theme uh, is, is going to be an essential question in... Uh, um, crime and punishment, right? So even though, you know, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy are so different in so many ways, but they they really share a lot in the sense of their, their concern with the, these deep questions of meaning and, and uh, in life and love and happiness and rebirth and things like this, the possibility of rebirth. Okay, let's look at one more scene. Давайте посмотрим на еще одну ключевую сцену из романа. Let's look at another key scene from the novel. Andrei padded во время битвы против Наполеона под Австерлицем. Andrei falls, he falls in battle, 
uh, during uh, the battle against Napoleon, uh, liter- literally under Austerlitz. That means near Austerlitz. This is the Battle of Austerlitz. Он лежит на спине и смотрит вверх в небо. So in the scene, he is in a lying position, right? He's fallen in battle. He is in a lying position on his back, and he's looking upwards into the sky. And we get one of the most uh, most important, memorable scenes in the novel. На ним не было ничего уже кроме неба. Above him, there was nothing. Literally, already there was nothing. There was nothing anymore except for sky, right? Nothing but sky. He's looking straight up. Как же я не видал прежде этого высокого неба? How can it be that I didn't see before this lofty sky, right? This tall sky, высокий, right? Lofty. И как я счастлив, что узнал его наконец. And how happy I am that I've that I've come to see it. I've recognized it at last. Okay, so in the book, this is spelled out a bit more, I think, right? That he these people have been running around in the battle. It's chaotic. It's, it seems to be totally meaningless, and Tolstoy does a wonderful job of describing this, this, the, the, the essential idiocy of this, this, of human strife, basically. Um, and all of a sudden, Andre finds himself looking up, um, right, and all he sees is is sky, right, and he's, he certainly gains this this uh, very different perspective on the world, right, and he feels that he's been ignoring this. Uh, this kind of, I don't know, deep mystery his whole life. Right, and he says, I'm so happy that I found it at last. Да, все пустое, все обман, кроме этого бесконечного неба. Yes, indeed, everything is empty, or we could say vain. Everything is vain, everything's empty, everything is illusion, except for this endless or infinite sky. Ничего, ничего нет, кроме его. There is nothing, there is nothing except for it. No и того даже нет. Ничего нет, кроме тишины и успокоения. И слава Богу. Right, but even it is not. There is nothing except for silence or silence and calm. I guess we have this this moment of, right, he, he goes a bit deeper, right? He says not only earthly vanities are all empty, they're all an illusion, uh, but indeed, even the sky is is kind of an, an illusion. Even it is kind of masking this deeper calm and, and infinite uh, solace and silence. E slava Bogu, right? And pray, praise be to God, glory to God. Okay, so uh, if that, uh, you know, uh, 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 whets your appetite for some Tolstoy, then do make a point at some time in your life to read all of uh, War and Peace. It's really great. And by the way, I'll close today by mentioning the, uh, if you look on my website, I've got a, under the classical music section, I've got a little selection of Andrei Balkonsky's aria from the, the Prokofiev opera War and Peace, which follows the text of the original very closely. So if you, if you look at that now, I've got the text there from the, uh, of the aria, and you'll see that it, it mirrors very closely the original Tolstoy text, right? But in the opera, there, it, the opera actually opens with the scene of riding past the oak tree. Um, yeah, and by the way, I should also add that there's a really wonderful, epic uh, uh, screen version of uh, War and Peace made by, uh, during the Soviet days. I think it's got like seven uh, segments to it, right? It's, so it's like six or seven hours long or something, but it's really incredible, especially the battle scenes which were done before, you know, computer uh, effects or anything like this, right? Special effects, just these massive shots with seemingly thousands of people and horses swirling around. It's it's really a, a, a quite a spectacle. Uh, so again, if you like War and Peace, be sure and check that that uh, old Soviet version of the movie out. Uh, okay, so anyway, that's it for today. Uh, until next time, uh, do svidaniya.